Hey, you gorgeous humans. I am excited to be back in the space of podcasting. And I didn't plan this first episode. It's been sitting on the edge of my tongue for a while. And I'm grateful um, for the spaciousness that I've been able to explore and allow myself over the last year. <laughs> Uh, moving through different um, phases of employment and evolving my life in different ways. And really the last year has been a siphoning out of the systems and relationships that were and have been not conducive to a sense of peace within my body. Um, my nervous system... <laughs> created, it, I just had less capacity to mask and that led to having to set some firm boundaries with some very close relationships in order for me to find a sustainable way to move forward for myself and also for my children, even though they're teenagers and adults now, I still see a future where um, they're still like my favorite people. <laughs> so um, creating a future that's inclusive of all the things that I would like to experience with those people. <laughs> um, and also being able to have the spaciousness within the relationships that I have so consciously created over the last uh, <laughs> lifetime really, uh, but being able to create a support a supportive community around me that is now welcome to witnessing me through a different lens and spectrum than what I've been known as before. And everyone's known me as the super resilient, super happy Pollyanna type and happy to help, happy to, you know, uh, give of myself. <sighs> and then going through a space of having no capacity to do that for others and barely finding the capacity for myself and my own children. Um, and then like having to learn humility um, and the grace that humility is. <laughs> like I am so grateful and I will say that I'm not identifying as a professional anything moving forward. This is a personal vlogging type podcast. That is the intention for this. <clears throat> and I, so if you want, go and get other advice. You don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to adopt my opinions. This is my experience. And because it's my experience, I am able to be fully expressed in it. And like I mentioned on my Instagram stories, if you're not following me, oh goodness, I've actually just changed my name on Instagram. I think it's I am Catherine Spiller now. K A T H E R I N E S P I W -L, L E R. <laughs> I kind of figure the best way for me to move forward, the only thing that keeps on coming back to is for me to own my name. And that's the name that I was branded with. When I first came into the conception of the world, when my breath was breathing and my parents decided that that was the name that was going to be given to the soul experience of me. And oh my goodness, can I get into some of this? Let me tell you now. Like if you want some conspiracy theory rabbit holes, then just stick around long enough and I'll, I'll definitely spill them. Uh, but yes, my straw man is... Catherine Spiller, and I'm happy to use that as a uh, little label to move forward with my life's work because I'm like in this game, there ain't no escaping. <laughs> and um, I just know the type of people that I'm starting to attract into my space and I am so excited by the innovative thinking and like the amount of compassion that I am finding uh, from people from all walks of life going through different um, 
cataclysmic moments, having major epiphanies, um, realizations, seeing, like not being able to be in a place of avoidance anymore, like having to look and see what the family patterns are. You know, <clears throat> why, am I why are my children, you know, talking about unaliving themselves? Why is... Why is suicide such a taboo subject that we even have to change the name to unaliving? Like, what is going on in society? And for the longest time, for at least the first 30 years of my life, I was told about this apocalypse, the second coming, that shit was going to get real and, you know, we've just, you know, we're in the last days. This is like the final test. And basically put this life on hold for the next life and I would to I totally subscribe to that so my nervous system was set to not perceiving physical threat as much as spiritual threat and what is spiritual threat beyond a belief system that's being created and it's linked the mental with the emotional and the physical to create a sense of existential crisis when there's actually nothing going wrong or threatening in the 3D world. And when you start to understand quantum physics, you can see why organized religion is like so detrimental. And that self-determination is actually the way of the future. Um, so learning how to become a self-determined self individual is like, that's the adaptability. Like we're not gonna survive just on um, security. We actually, there's no such thing as set straight out, right, safe. Like, but what we can do is start to create safety in layers that reach down to an existential core, understanding that there are people whose nervous systems are not set to this reality. <sighs> and I know that there's a lot in that and there's a lot of nuance in what I'm talking about and I think that that's an important thing to lean into the nuance of the experience of like understanding our purpose because if our if the next generation don't find hope in their future what are we freaking doing we're doing evolution wrong you know <laughs> and so I guess this is a space where I kind of feel like at least for the foreseeable future, I want to come and just sort of spill my guts and talk about what's on my mind and have an outlet for my, um, my human experience. And I don't want it to be a tell-all of all of the things and the people that I've ever interacted with or anything like that. My intention really is to show that there's like ultimately... Ultimately, I have major lover girl energy. I just, I always come to a place of having a sense of love and deep gratitude for just being alive, for just being able to appreciate the sky the way that it is, for the food that's in front of me that I don't even have to cook sometimes. And, you know, for even just the simplicity of a little butterfly floating by. Like, I honestly, when left to my own devices, I become a bit of a Disney princess. And I love that about myself. I really enjoy that about myself. And I get there when I am in a space of sensitivity and leaning into my sensitivity. <laughs> And if you're listening and you can't see the video, I actually um, twitch. I have like a shiver that goes up my spine. So I would like to reintroduce myself. And because I'm not the same person that I was on my old podcast, Wild Woman Free, or the second podcast that only had one episode, Everyday Alchemy. <laughs> um, they're still up there, I believe. Um, but this is something else. And I wanted to start this off in a place of imperfection because I have so much perfectionism still. And it haunts me because I can see all the ways that things can be better and yet that paralyzes me. And having the... Um, having the... Oh, compassion 
I'm finding that compassion is the thing that helps to move things forward without force. <laughs> um, I realised it was compassion for my children's experience. And this is, you know, yes, I can talk about it as an ICPKP qualified kinesiologist. Um, and I can talk about it from the perspective of, you know, neuroplasticity, quantum physics, all the things that I've been, like, obsessing over for so long, like I'm researching on. And, and I could even look at it from, like, a global agenda from a conspiracy theorist point of view. Um, and also from a Christian point of view, because I can see a lot of the benefits from looking at these things with so many different lenses. Shamanic, you know, the experience of going through um, mental health struggles with your children. Like, I realized, in, so my story, <laughs> if I can sum it up in a short amount of time. <laughs> um, I am Catherine. I was, oh, where do we even start? You know what, modern story. Modern story, most recently in 2019, I was an independent single mom with four kids living in Brisbane. I got adrenal fatigue. I just overworked and hustled and poured everything into trying to maintain a certain lifestyle and standard um, for my children you know, to sort of <laughs> maintain some equilibrium with their life. Um, and I just couldn't keep up. And my nervous system couldn't keep up because I was also being their emotional support. Um, like I was there as a large, you know, because I didn't realise just how much anxiety our family had. <laughs> Um, largely because I, I mean, I had it. I didn't even realise I had it. <sighs> so in 2019, I just, I ended up moving down to the Gold Coast onto my family's property, uh, the property that I grew up in, in the hinterland. And it was the most humbling time of my life. I moved into a shed and <laughs> that was, <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was hell. <laughs> Um, and it was in that shed that all of my children experienced mental health struggles and I even had one. Um, one of my children uh, tell me that they had planned their suicide and to not, to not try and stop them. And for me that created a major undoing. I, could, I didn't have energy anymore to distract myself away from what was happening to my children. I didn't have the energy to work and I used work so much I realised as a distraction away and an avoidance of looking at the things that my children were actually experiencing. And I was expecting them to deny their lived experience basically to fit and conform to my pace as the mother and the, par the you know, primary parent. Um, because there's a certain system in which we need to operate and that takes preference over the individual's experience of that system. <laughs> and um, and I, at the time I didn't realise it but that really created a situation where my body needed rest and these children wanted to be up, teenagers wanted to be up and, and talking through these, feel, these heavy heavy feelings and my body needed rest and so having to set boundaries in that state was I can't tell you how terrifying that was um still to this day I don't think I've had nights as awful as that um trying to fall asleep um you know with the threats of a teenager who's just had their phone taken off them and they're in a state like that and I'm not saying to do this, not, not whatsoever. I'm just saying I got to a place where um, the experiences of my, you know, children self-harming in different ways and, you know, their, their struggle and not being able to help and their judgments of me in that space and, and my lack of capacity now and, you know... Um, 
it was a really difficult and dark time and it was several years of this dark if it like in hindsight I see it as dark energy just shifting out of our family because I realized that within the generational healing spectrum um all the different layers that you can put on it I tried to look at what the patterns mainly are like what is the generational curse that I can see maybe within my own family because this whole this whole thing is only controlled through our own experience so if you want to help your kids it's like you have to help yourself that's the only way you help your kids and so that's why it's like you have to have some of these deep like I mean not that you have to but there's an element of shedding of these dark nights of the soul that I think um, there's like a portal of being alone to walk through and that you need to be alone in the experience and that your child is alone in the experience in some way and that there's a resilience through that experience that almost burns off the old ego of the refiner's fire and you look at each other anew in the morning and you're just like, okay, we made it through we made it through another night they're still here and I'm just grateful that we're all breathing and when you know when you don't have money to buy meat and there's so much pressure all around you that you know, because you've left the church, you're a certain way now. And of course, all this stuff is happening to you because of this, this and that, that. This is what happens. And, and to still be able to tap into this sense of peace within me of like, it's going to be okay. Like, this is just... And for all the feedback that I was getting to be rest, 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 rest. Ooh. It was the start of detoxing codependency out of my life. And codependency as more of a clinical term not just like a you know instagram type of codependency just like you know enmeshed family systems and learning what dynamics are healthy and what dynamics um are harmful and also not knowing because realizing that uh, like even all the study and all the experts and everything like that, they're, they're, they're behind. They're, they don't have access to the depth of information of the experience that I've lived or that me as a younger child had lived or me as a younger mother had lived, that what, the information that my mother had lived, the information that my grandmother had lived, you know, and following that line backwards, you know, looking at the pattern of behaviours between relationships and... Um, you know, realizing too, like at this time, so this is, you know, 2019, 2020. It's 2020 when I started channeling my great grandmother. Um, I asked, I was in the bathtub and kind of was just being silly and used plant medicine. Actually, plant medicine has been a big part of my journey um, and opening, like letting go of prejudice around plant medicine and also um, embodying a sense like there was during this process and all these traumas there was a new spectrum of healing that was opened to me and it was during the, a point where I literally just thought I'd break and I walked into the ocean and I, I know I've told this story so many times that I'm like mother mother ocean this is too much I, I can't I'm gonna break and I just, I just felt it all through me, the words like, no, you're not. You're not going to break. You've done that before. There's another way. And I'm like, okay, tell me. Tell me what it is and I'll do it. 
And the impression was, lay your head back and float. And I remembered that the philosophy of Wu Wei, which is, you know, not the non-force of nature, like the divine unfolding of nature. And I decided to just physically lay my head back in the ocean. And I, f I felt this sense of bliss around me. And the next six weeks were a deep dive into the surrender of timing. I knew the healer that I needed to complete this family healing. And I also had to surrender to the timing of it. And it just so happened that miracle after miracle and all these things that were set in place longer than, like from before I even knew I needed them. It was all set, it was all set up. It was all set up. And I couldn't have planned that. I couldn't have planned those miracles. And, it, and it ever since then has been miracle after miracle after miracle. You know, and meeting someone who I thought I would be in love with and with for the rest of my life, a, a life partner, meeting and falling in love so deeply and choosing so deeply as I do, I, and I really do, and I love that about myself because one of the things I really love about myself is the way I love. And I realize like I have a sense of safety within intimacy and vulnerability I feel like if we can hold compassion and grace for the human experience within us like won't that make life so much gentler <laughs> and make it just so that we're a lot easier like it's so much simpler to just express who we are naturally and then there's like no need for God or like pretense or anything we get to just exist as our own selves so that's one of the philosophies that I, it, it's good for my nervous system <laughs> and I really, really love the people who are naturally vibrating in my space as I sink into the loveliness of things and I mean we could call it love bombing, there's so many <sighs> and yet it's just I love to love and I'm working even more to um, learn ways of creating standards for the ways that I want to give my love and expectations that I might hold that I'm wanting to let go of and hold myself to higher standards and therefore receive higher standards in the way I love. So I believe that it's sinking into the depth of that love the love that, yes, I was giving to a man as well. Um, and it was helping me through a lot of the trauma that I was experiencing, um, the generational healings that were going on at that time with my children and with my family, you know, members, some family members, and, and also with my great-grandmother who was channeling through me with information until I got to a point where I had to ask that, the great grandmother to stop. <laughs> I'm, I was no longer open to um, receiving any further in instruction <laughs> through that mechanism. Um, and it was also during this time that I ended up, I in 2021, I had a third eye, or what I thought was a third eye experience at the time. And with a little bit more insight and speaking to people who have had um, like near-death experiences and extrasensory like experiences like I starting to understand that it was like a kundalini activation so it was a spontaneous activation and I know so many people like well, don't talk about this people will think you're crazy and I kind of just don't care anymore because it was a real happening that actually happened so it's like I'm not going to gaslight myself and say it didn't happen to me when it was quite spectacular. And it was, it's also interesting because even though it was a spectacular happening, um, it still created like change that I later um, 
viewed as trauma and I viewed it as trauma in an attempt to get compassion for what I'd experienced in and while I was like gathering the strength I would say like I was I was gathering strength to be able to hold my experience even more on my own and that was something that was really difficult and I tried to navigate as consciously as I could and have as much conversation as I could <laughs> And that's probably all sounding nuanced. But what the third eye experience gave me was clarity over my timing and pace. And when I realised that the timing was perfect, I realised that reality wasn't real to the extent that we think that it is. And I... I witnessed, what I witnessed was the disintegration of a tree in front of me. And I'm talking, this was like, I can't remember what day of the week it was. But I was literally like just riding my scooter through town and dropped my son off at school and then scooted back and meditated by a creek. And there was literally a half like milk carton in the fruit, in the tree broken, you know, like <laughs> super and glamorous, like just down the road and I was meditating on light and that all light contains data and information and it's really just the programming of our mind that um, that places the meaning and frames reality and I was just contemplating just curiously contemplating like the literal experience of what that might be and cons like feeling through the energy of what that would be if I was to be like a omnipotent observer of it, <laughs> if that makes sense. So I was just playing with this idea and like a crystal ball, holding it from lots of different angles, curiously, just like in a sense of wonder and awe and like I wonder like what that would even feel like. And I literally, this tree in front, and I had my hand in the dirt, and I was like, okay, earth. Like, there's even all the sensations of my fingertips going through the dirt. All of that, it's all information that's getting interpreted. It's just electrical impulses getting interpreted on my brain. It's just data. And I'm interpreting what it means. And I was like, okay, earth, you know, tell me what you know <laughs> and then the tree in front of me started to disintegrate into like a code and the light so the the light was really bright and maybe a little misty and so my per perceptions like my light the lights turned on and and it was it was a really different it's like if there was a filter over my eyes and it changed, things changed after that. Um, but I also, when I realized that the tree was just like this code, code type thing, um, I felt the joy drain out of my body. It was really, I felt so sad because I love the tree and I love nature and I love the way that I feel in nature. And so I found myself like, no, is my experience going to be like this because I see a different fabric of reality? And, um, and then I remembered the matrix and I was like, well, I remember watching that part when, as a kid of Cypher when he was going to chop up the steak and he was like, you know, I wish I had taken the blue pill because I'm eating the steak and I'm really, and I'm obviously getting this wrong. Like I'm eating the steak and I can't enjoy it because I know it's not real. <laughs> and then him going on, like I, I kind of witnessed that back then and just like, why can't he just sink into the enjoyment of it without it being real? And so with that, in my mind and as a memory from childhood, like as a teenager watching The Matrix, 
um, I then was like, hang on, I get to choose the level of involvement that I have now with this 3D reality, right? I'm like, this is, this is rad. <laughs> and I considered, well, what if we put the red pill and the blue pill together and we made the purple pill? And look, my, I'm, I'm, if you are listening to the podcast, I'm actually holding up an amethyst um, pendulum. I had a friend, a very dear friend, a brother, drop by and he gave this to me. Yeah, just another person going through these big spiritual shifts. And we say spiritual because it's interacting with an element of our instinct and intuition, the divine within each of us. And the beauty of the nuance is that <clears throat> it's not held in a certain People who get it will get it. And this journey is not necessarily highly specific in order or hierarchy or anything. So you're going to have different experiences at different times and it's going to be paradoxical and <laughs> cataclysmic and big and not big at the same time. And only you're going to know what that is. And I think that this is why I want to talk and be so open and vulnerable about my experiences with, um, you know, the energy and as an energy worker, like just how you don't need to know everything. It was essential that I let go of the train, like the training helped me enough to build the belief that these things existed and I'd had enough extrasensory experiences and friends who are psychic and everything to go, oh, well, a lot of my gifts aren't that obvious. Um, I have a massive sense of curiosity, which is why I wanted to create this platform as well, because my intention is to ask a whole lot of questions. I have some of the most incredible humans that I ha have ever existed within my circle of friends. And I seem to, uh, I seem to magnetize people who have a massive hearts like and just incredible talent and they know their epicness it's just that they have not ex been experiencing some things the way that they thought that they would be and I watch these people continue to rise <laughs> and the conversations we have I'm like if people could hear this for free simply and just gently just these random conversations between humans who have been through experiences which are highly uncomfortable which feel like you're the only human experience there's no other human that can possibly validate that third eye experience for me there is no other human and I've been to a few healers and what they have done is support me on my journey and what I really wanted was someone who would support me while I was supporting myself and I think that that's what trauma brings. When you've got practitioners who are trauma informed and I would say people who have personally experienced trauma, like if you can create a framework to be able to present that in a way that's really gentle and non-authoritative, then I believe that they actually hold codes that are stronger than people who have learned about trauma clinically. And I feel like there's, convers and there's room at the table for both. Like, yes, research is important and research is actually also super limited because if you have a look at like, oh... Especially when the, when the conversation of energy comes into it. You start to realise how limited our scientific processes are. They don't take into account quantum physics. Yet, much of our research does not take into account quantum physics. And so it's really hard to get behind when you just, you're looking at the parameters of a research paper or something like that. And you're just like, hang on, they haven't actually, you know, one of the best things I think, though, which is in our research, is... Um, the placebo effect and that's all you really need and this is why Joe Dispenza's work is really epic like Dr. Joe Dispenza I should say uh, and Dr. Bruce Lipton um, because it's living proof that when you start to work with your relationship with the unknown or spirituality or whatever you want to call it um, then you start to open up the field of possibility of what is possible <laughs> So, you know, you start to program things 
the future and possibilities and your body and lots of different things to be more in your favor because we're able to actually set our we set our belief system we set our ner- nervous system to our belief systems so if we can go through and consciously work through our belief systems while neutralizing to the fact that we are just as right or wrong as nature is <laughs> like if we can surrender to the nature of our divinity too right our divine connection to the element that gives us life and and sustains our animation <laughs> in this life, then if we can be a little more self-determined and encourage our children to be a little more self-determined, then maybe we might be okay. Maybe we can evolve in ways that are leaps and bounds beyond, you know, what we think is possible because what we think is so limited. Our mental capacity is so much more limited than our heart capacity. And there's even research to say that there are more neurons in the heart than there are in the brain. The heart has a deeper level of understanding and yet it is grossly underestimated with many policies and um, systems and procedures that are currently in place. And that's why there are so many people falling out of the workforce and like struggling to um, survive in this system because it's not focused on the human experience. It's focused on the human as a number. And, you know, interestingly enough, people don't have it that's not sustainable we're not robots we're human experiences and people power is stronger than systems institutions especially ones out of self-interest and that are parasitic you know we we can't sustain things that don't sustain us it's just against the law of reciprocity so when you start to value the human experience of any system or policy or this it has to do with the home as well. When we start to include all individuals as having rights and a say and a voice to be fully expressed and to find a place of peace and comfort at the end of the night, if that can be a shared space <clears throat> and then the grace to be able to explore our own identities that's the way that I was able to move through the hell that I'd experienced as a single mum with teenagers who were really struggling while well, I was really struggling too. You know, I, I allowed the experience of being a mum to those teenagers to change who I was fundamentally from what I experienced in teenage years and, you know, becoming the mum that I wanted ultimately. And... I try. I, I started off being the mum, trying to be the mum that I wanted, and I found myself to be very controlling. And moving to a lot more gentle parenting, I felt like created a lot more connection with my children, letting them see me as imperfect and like stating my weaknesses and showing my vulnerability to them. You know, not as, not to, and that's probably parentifying, but I guess for me, I was just like, hey, I was disillusioned by a lot of this stuff. I would like for you to see how it is. There's real time human skills that you need to develop, and it seems like I'm developing some of those with you. And some of that was like looking after finances and trying to understand the financial systems and things like that. When for me, like, as, you know, growing up in a system that was very much like, you know, you're a woman, you get married, you have kids, you're looked after for life by your husband. I was not prepared to look after. I, I was very ill-prepared at looking after the finances of a family. And so I used all that divorce money basically to try and fund myself a little bit more as working. So getting dinners sent to the house, Uber Eats, I am so grateful. You know, I basically paid for a wife. You know, someone, I paid for cleaners to come and clean the house. I got massages. Um, I was able to bring the kids to the snow and do things that I was, you know, otherwise hadn't done before and that they hadn't experienced. And I was, like, it's so interesting how much I judge myself for the way that I used the money after the divorce. But I have a look back and I'm like, well, the system that we were raised in, which we all agreed on, you know, was the wife stays home and the husband goes to work. 
And what that leads to is financial abuse. And what that leads to is an incompetence in learning how to do money. And that's one thing that I could turn around and easily just blame. Well, it's the system's fault. And it's like, at the end of the day, talking like that <laughs> is extremely disempowering. And the only way that I've made any traction in my life is to pull the responsibility 100% onto myself. And so while we can say this system isn't working, we also, on the other hand, are highly, highly accountable to creating our own systems. <laughs> um, and that's, that's basically the responsibility that we, you know, I, um, I wanted to create a new system with someone. I wanted to do it with, um, you know, I thought doing it with a man, with a life partner, that's how I'm going to create my new systems. And all the while, what I was doing was building myself. Like, I've been building myself to connect with people, and I've been really freaking good at it. I have built some of the most solid, beautiful connections so consciously without, like, hiding my hyper <laughs> sensitivity and anxiety and things like that to be fully expressed helps me to feel safer to shine my light. And I think... You know, not everyone is for everyone and that's okay. We don't have to blame the people in the past and they're not always going to be those same people and they don't have to be for our future either. And I think, like, the less that we're able to judge things, the faster we're able to move through things, it creates more of, like, an agile energy where it's like, oh, these lessons were here for me to evolve and I've been able to do that. And so that, it's me who is the system. I, like, do I trust myself to be able to go in and make changes where I need to, when I need to, instead of having one set system that I can rely on to look a certain way all of the time? It's more so that I've built up a skill set where it's like I know that I have the capacity to deal and I'm choosing these responsibilities because I want... I want them for me. I, I want the responsibility to take care of myself financially. I want that. That is, it feels like a joy to me. And I want to find the right way to do it where the energy feels right to my nervous system, right? So it's now there are other things that, there are more things that are important to me now than ever before, you know, and a lot more of those have to do with me and letting go of the people pleasing and falling into a place of like, deeply loving and accepting my past whilst also not letting it define my future like anything is possible the future has not happened yet and this comes back to that whole apocalyptic thing like guys the world still has not ended and how many times have we been told to watch out and like I honestly believe that it's that fear energy that caution energy that's so disempowering to us because if we followed our joy like, it's that spiritual trauma of something's going to go wrong, so don't get too excited, don't get too happy, don't experience your high, because there's going to be lows. And it's like, there's a cycle in life where if we learn how to not resist it, we can actually use it and create joy within it. It doesn't have to be the worst thing ever. Like... You know, maybe it's the resistance of life that actually creates the suffering. So I guess I, I went through stages of, um, you know, after the third eye experience of <sighs> anxiety was just never the same in my body again. It just was not the same. Uh, and I came across someone... Uh, Alexia Francesca, Francesca, I think her name is, on YouTube, and she was sharing about her experience and her awakening, you know, having had lymph nodes out of her um, throat, and then she was starting to see auras after she woke up from that. And, you know, just how over the next seven years her body was literally telling her, like, resonating people out of her life because of the pain, and I that was able to help recognize like reconcile the pain that I felt in my abdomen um, after the third eye experience. Like I got, I got that pain in my abdomen and it was just like a solid, like a year at least, year and a half um, until I sort of shifted that pain and that pain ended up going 
after my partner and I broke up and he moved out of the house and that was several months ago now and it's interesting because I haven't secured like set um, and stable income yet but what I've noticed is like every single week there's a miracle that ends up turning up and it's been happening for weeks and it's mind-blowing and it's something that only just tips over and like then the rent is taken care of and um you know and I went because I went from employment I had to take a break from being a healer I had to integrate some of the information from that third eye experience for myself and it had to not be I had to take responsibility for me and know what that felt like without having any responsibility for anyone else's healing and I didn't know like Thank goodness that you go into things not knowing sometimes why you do things. And this is the beautiful act of faithful surrender, right, to the intuition because it can't be logic. Like your heart is not going to speak to you in the ways that the head is going to understand. You need to surrender the logic and reason in order to understand what the heart has to say. So, you know, and in, on a practical level, what that means is like, okay, I can't be a healer. I actually need to let go of all the healing that I've ever known and start integrating back into society because I need money. <laughs> and then it was like, money is a slave rule system. How can I subscribe to this kind of system and be an integrity? And then, you know, going to a healer. Oh, Lisa, who I studied kinesiology with, and I just, I'm so grateful for her and the reflection that she holds of me and my experience, and because she has seen so much of my experience and is definitely um, a safe space for me. One of the first ones that I really, really felt into, and I was so grateful for um, after leaving church, you know. So she's known me over many iterations of my life, and I'm grateful for that. So her holding that space for me while I was like negotiating like what, um, like how to interact with money and <laughs> also because of some of the information around money that was in the third eye experience um, because that channel was so clear and I had so much um, information, like so many questions on my mind. Um, but yeah, I was just like, okay, I need to interact with society and I can't be a healer right now. My nervous system is shot. <laughs> uh, I'm like, I'm going to be a barista in a cafe. That's what I'm going to do. So I went and got my coffee training and I got a job in a bakery and I was in the bakery for five months and honestly, it felt like a little, um, what's the word? It was like a fairy tale. I met the raddest friends and like I just, I felt like I was 18 again and in touch with this youth, youthful part of myself that I'd missed, you know, throughout this heavy, like it did end up feeling like heavy healing um, and, and detoxing through some of my old relationship patterns, like through the end of that relationship with um, my partner at the time. And I can say it was like a solid year of grieving and like consciously witnessing the um, disintegration of that relationship and that connection that I loved so much. It was literally like I look at um, I look at who I was and, and my ability to have rose-colored glasses and see the absolute best in every situation because it's like that to me is the most obvious thing you know, the good that's about to come from the hard times. And the, the, I see when there's shit that's on the table, I'm like, oh, I know what we can do with this. Like, this is, this is an opportunity. We don't have to be defeated by this. And, and for things to disintegrate, even though you're still that vulnerable and you still try so hard, and noticing my confidence go down and my light go down and my desire to hide and be alone again and there's so much healing that happens in that space and also having this desire to share this experience but also wanting it just for me <laughs> and you know now coming to a place of months later like being really grateful that it happened the way that it all happened because 
what I experienced in that relationship was my capacity to love and oh my gosh and I'm like oh I've spent a lifetime giving this love away to other people (laughs) and it's the most delicious thing ever and I just want it for me right now and I'm just like so grateful that I have the time (laughs) the time and the space and I'm in a beautiful home and I have time for myself and I have time for my children and you know four years on from living in the hell of that shed and the difficulties that every single one of my children were going through I now see all of them all four of them They're all excelling on their chosen journeys. <sighs> the youngest is 15 next week, and there's not the stress or the anxiety with them that there used to be. It's just so different now, you know. And I feel a liberation in the future and for my future and for my future with them and my relationship with them because they are special people to me. And yet I can see their space from me as necessary for their own growth. Like it's not going to be forever just us all the time, you know. They have a future and they've got life to expand into and it's hard to negotiate you know, what the guidelines are as they expand and as you let go of control and what that means and and being able to hold them accountable to their own responsibilities because that's like we're not raising kids, we're raising adults, you know, like they need to be able to feel the impact of their actions. That's loving, it's so loving. They need to be able to see you as your own experience while you support them while they try to support their own experience, right? And one of the best ways we can do that is with compassionate conversation, you know, the ability to be fully expressed. And that means that you need to value yourself and you need to value your expression as the mom, you know, and that because it's essential to connection. (laughs) You cannot have a relationship where you're the intimacy of your experience is not welcome to be expressed and shared directly and consciously with that person. So a gift I have given my children is, hey, I know in the future as we evolve, you're going to look back at behaviors that I have done and you are going to be like, mom, what the frick were you thinking here and here and you did this and whatever. And You might experience pain and I would say, please bring that to me. Please do. Because if there's ever anything that's going to be getting in the way of of you feeling a connection with me, I want to know it. I want to see it. I I don't want to avoid it. What you feel is valid and I'm here to work through things with you. And we might think that that might be manipulated. And we can move with our own intuition on things at those times. And yet, we can still hold elements of belief for the other human's experience. Our child, our lovers, our previous partners, our parents, our siblings, our friends. Like, the ones that are no longer in our lives or not currently in our lives. You know, people that we've moved on from and where we didn't get resolution and where the pain that they caused us wasn't acknowledged and they still demanded availability and proximity and accessibility. And my presence is the most precious thing to me and it's potent and I've worked really hard on who I am and I've loved the last few years of like growing my hair, <laughs> my underarm hair, my leg hair, of not wearing makeup, of this whole sense of unbecoming, which I'm writing about in my book. And I'm just like, 
I'm kind of, in, I'm just in love with who I am, okay? And it's like, I love that I get to girl crush, girl crush, and he just, just crush on myself. Because it's like, <laughs> I love the way I love. <laughs> and now I get to experience it really firsthand. And I love sharing, sharing that with you, the listener, whoever hears this. Because my intention is to, sh while I'm sharing this with you, I would love for you to see it as a possibility that you can love yourself this deeply and that it can create a sense of agility through times that, you know, feel insecure. Like, there's, there's these parts, well, you can see lots of things about you that you might want to change. Deep down, you have this deep sense of love and trust within you that you have you, that you are this beautiful, pure-hearted, innocent ray of divine light that is just shimmering all through this world and that there are places and spaces that will celebrate that and encourage your shine and you are welcome to be in those places and, and eventually your energy will probably not sustain you anywhere else. And that's okay. We don't judge those places. We all just have different frequencies. And when we tap into our frequency, we find our people. And it's not going to take a whole lot of energy because we don't have to force the nature of who we are. It's the simplest thing, which is why the motto simpler and gentler for myself was like I had to adopt that in order to be able to adapt and float through life a lot simpler. So to fast forward where I am, I <laughs> cut a long story short. <laughs> um, I ended working at the bakery so that I could secure a rental and I became an office manager. And I really struggled in the corporate environment and as grateful as I was for that opportunity and what an epic opportunity it really was, my physical body was experiencing so much chronic pain because of the anxiety that I was in. So I started cutting down, tried to put some effort into the relationship to save my relationship. And so <laughs> within a month, my partner left and I um, resigned from being an office manager. And that was at the end of last year. And ever since it's been a faithful and ever since it's just been miracle after miracle that's seen me still here and so I am open for one-on-one -on -one consultations um, hour-long conversations because sometimes that's all you need to have uh, where your energetic signature is reflected back to you so that you create the, your own authority and all I am is information a mirror so I call those a soul check-in and I use a combination of all my information, but ultimately I just tap into a heart space of compassion for you. And what that compassion does is help me to understand the energy of what it is that you're telling me, your situation and your circumstance, the experience, the human experience that's within you that's seeking resolution. And you know that you've got the answers. It's just that little, the little bit out of reach I am a reflection of truth um, and it's intuitive it's a gift I have I see light I do see shadows too and so I'm able to speak into those because they both sort of feed and accentuate each other it's like that it's the Tao Te Ching you know like it's yin and yang it's it's the flow of energy and it, it's not right or wrong. It's like learning how to move with the flow of energy. Um, so I do have those one hour soul check-ins and you can book in with me on katherinespiller.as.me. So K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E-S-P-I-L-L-E-R dot A-S dot M-E. So I can put that in the show notes as well. Um, Another way to work with me would be um, a mentorship. So I usually do 
to a moon cycle. I like to do it to a moon phase, but basically it's just a space where we tailor make um, whatever kind of a program it is that you need, that you would like support in through a transitionary time where you feel as though your your, um, energy is sensitive and you'd like some gentle support and that reflective mirror a little bit more intimately then that's where that spiritual mentoring comes in. Um, And that has like voice recording, like voice memo access So and like weekly calls and it's a lot closer and it doesn't look one sort of way. It's very much tailor-made and you get an audio too, like a subliminal to help you with some of that effortless change. Um, So, but basically, if you want to reach out for a conversation and we can see if working with me is a fit and if not, I hope that you enjoy some of the content that I end up coming out with and some of these conversations that I had. I would love to hear your feedback. Um, And if you would like to donate, I'm going to set up a donation link if I can, um, either on my website or... um, through my booking system. I'm going to have a look at that and set up a donation link. So if you would like to make a donation, um, I would be so appreciative because I've owned, I've done this all self-funded and I love that and it's definitely a gift that I see myself giving um, because I kind of, if I can share my human experience, that that's just extra data for people. And if AI want to kind of get a hold of some of that data, then I'm sweet as, like... <laughs> If, they, if, if my um, human data was uploaded to AI, I'd be very happy with what they would see. Um, and I think that that's, one of the, one, that's a beautiful way to live. So in that sense, I was really grateful for being raised with an eternal perspective beyond just a physical perspective. Uh, I know that that's not a normal type of a thing for most people who are uh, not Christian or non-religious. Um, And yet I'm grateful for that because um, it's created a different spectrum of understanding this life. And it makes the creation of life so much more fun. I don't know. I just, I am really grateful for the learnings that I've received when I've learned them. And I want to share that with everyone. I feel like that's a really beautiful way to gift those lessons back to people. In any case... I'm going to leave that there and upload this as my first podcast. And I would love to hear back any feedback that you would like to give. Uh, Instagram is probably the best way to contact me at the moment or Facebook. And yeah, just know, just know that you are exactly where you need to be. There's no need to rush. We get to choose. And you are divinely guided and protected with a divine intelligence that is encoded into the skin of your heart. (laughs) You are so loved. I love you. You've got this.